Thanks, Janine, and thanks to all of you for coming out to this great event on the Thursday night. So I'm going to start out by introducing our panelists. And the format for tonight is our panelists will each talk for about 10 minutes on their respective topics, and then we'll take questions and answers from the audience. So I'll begin by introducing our director of the Cooper Center, Dr. Jerry Lips. Uh, Dr. Lips uh, is, as I say, the director of the Cooper Center. Uh, he came to Cal State Fullerton from UC Berkeley, where he was a professor for 22 years. He was also the uh, director and curator of the Museum of Paleontology at Berkeley, as well as chair of the Berkeley Natural History Museums. He's a world-renowned paleontologist, and amongst the many things that he's worked on in the past have been foraminifera, which are relevant to this because foraminifera are often used as a proxy for climate change in deep geologic time. So Jerry, in his portion of the talk, will uh, introduce the topic of climate change and speak about climate change in deep geologic time. Next, we have uh, Dr. Matt Kirby from the Geology Department at Cal State Fullerton. Dr. Kirby is an associate professor of geological sciences at Cal State Fullerton. He is an expert in the study of the terrestrial climate record as recorded in lake sediments. And he will speak about um, the climate change in Southern California over the last 10,000 years, so the more recent geologic past. And finally, our third panelist will be uh, Ms. Linda Marsa. Linda is an award-winning science writer, and she's a contributing editor at Discover Magazine, and she's the author of a just-released book called Fevered, which she has actually copies that you can purchase tonight, and she'll stay after the, the panel to uh, autograph copies if you're interested. Um, her topic will be, this evening, will be the impact of climate change on Southern California now and in the future. So I think you'll see that our panel goes from the deep geologic history of climate change to the more recent geologic record of climate change to what we see now and in the future. And with that, I'll pass off to our panelists. Thank you, David. We want to tell you about global climate change in Southern California, and I'd like to introduce the topic to you by showing you some phrases that have been used. Wrong button. By the climate deniers. You've probably heard this, maybe even at times you've felt some of these things yourself. We often hear that climate change is a hoax. Who's hoaxing who, I wonder? Al Gore's a fraud. I don't know what that has to do with climate change other than he has been a spokesperson, not a scientist. Obama wants to control us. That, that's too paranoid for me to talk about. Scientists exaggerate the problem. No, we don't. We're very conservative in the way we do science and the way we do climate change and that we are on the take, in other words, getting money from someplace. I wish I knew where to get that money, but I don't. And no, nobody's in it for the, for the money to speak of. And then scientists conspire, for example, in ClimateGate, when there was a thousand emails sent back and forth between climate scientists. I read every one of those, and it sounded like ordinary email chatter that goes between scientists. I've done it myself. Sometimes they're a little crude, sometimes they're a little uh, forward, but it's just conversation by email. And the latest one we hear now is that science, climate science is a religion. In other words, I guess we believe this, but in fact, there's just a lot more of this kind of stuff going on, and I'd like to address some of those issues. All of this is irresponsible in my view because science tells us through good data and good evidence that the climate not only is, will change, but it already has started to change. And it's irresponsible for people to take the view that you just saw because it's total misrepresentation of the facts 
Therefore, it's responsible, and it's irresponsible to future generations, if not us. With the kind of data we have from 20 or 30,000 scientists and scientific papers, plus what's going on around you today, we need to do something. Next slide. So why do these people say these things? Here's a list of possibilities that range from money all the way down to uh, genetics of behavior, that certain kinds of patterns of behavior, denial being a behavior, are genetically passed on. That's a hypothesis. It's certainly not political. In the, uh, I shouldn't, excuse me, it is political, but it's certainly not patriotic. And we don't want to just bury our heads in the sand and ignore all of this data and evidence and don't believe the people on TV that are ranting and raving about this stuff because they know very little about it. They're not scientists and the scientists, there are scientists amongst us that are on the tape and they're usually speaking as a climate denier and making a lot of money. Next. So who supports climate change besides scientists? Here's a whole list of organizations that support climate change. Let me just focus on a couple. Next, there's the Pentagon. The Pentagon thinks that climate change is a security issue for the United States. So they set up a climate change research center in Washington, I think it was, or near Washington, and the Republicans defunded it and told them not to do it. So they said, okay, we won't have a climate change research office. We'll just do it. And so they're still doing it. And that makes sense, doesn't it? The Navy worries about it too, because not only is climate change gonna change everything about the oceans, it's gonna raise sea level and wipe out most of their ports in one way or another. Next. The state of California, your taxes are paying for climate change mediation. The state of California as well as other governments, most countries, big cities, are all in this together and they're all planning to do something about climate change. In fact, are already doing things about climate change. Big petroleum corporations. These are the people that always get blamed for financing the anti-climate people. And indeed that's true. But they know more about climate change because they've got more earth scientists and bigger computers than any of us have. And they know it. They know what's going on out there. And what, what have they done? Well, they're getting ready to drill the Arctic. Shell already tried that. And they're already figuring out how to get their ships across the Northwest Passage when the Arctic ice melts. So everybody's for this. Even the Orange County Register in its news section reports regularly, maybe four or five times a week, on climate change articles, although the opinion pages are quite different. And insurance companies, these people don't mess around, as you know, they're covering their butts because they see lots and lots of problems coming down the road for them. So climate change is real. And it's, in a way, like car insurance. Do you drive your car without insurance? I mean, you're not planning on getting into an accident, but you want to have that insurance just in case. That's what we need to do with climate change. We need to develop policies and procedures and mitigations that will work when climate changes because it's gonna happen next. And why do these people support climate change? Because it's the evidence. And here's a whole list of things that are going on today. And it doesn't stop there. It's a complex thing, climate change, because it involves the atmosphere, it involves the surface of the earth, and it involves the oceans split up into different depths. And there's all kinds of things that are really important here. The ice sheets are melting, glaciers have melted, sea level is rising, 
And this, these will have serious effects on Orange County, as will drought and fires. Linda will tell us more about that. Next. That evidence is overwhelming. It's one of the best supported hypotheses we have in science today. So well supported that it really should be called the theory of climate change. Next slide. So what's the problem? Well, partly it's nature, partly it's us. This picture demonstrates both. Next. And what's that evidence? Well, I've given you some examples, and what we want to talk about tonight are the paleoclimatic records, the historical record, and current climatic events. We do not intend to talk much about models. People think models are science. Some models are based on science, but they are predictions. No prediction is ever totally accurate, and you'll see that there are different levels of, of prediction that involved here. Next. So this is the last 66 million years of Earth history showing temperature as derived from data on different kinds of organisms. And you can see that 66 million years ago, the average temperature of the Earth was about eight degrees. And it got up to 12 degrees uh, about 50 million years ago. And then we started downward trend, and there's a lot of jumping around here. That's the way the climate works. Big drop in climate there, and we know why. And then it raises, rises up here to about seven, eight degrees again, and then begins the refrigeration of the Earth as we get into this big cycle of ice age formation because of the isolation of Antarctica by currents once the Antarctic continent was uh, broken away from South America and Australia. Next slide. So that's the big scale. Here's the last 780,000 years, and these are cycles of interglacials, warm periods, <clears throat> and glacials. And the peaks are warm periods, and you'll notice, for example, here's 125,000 years ago, and here's today, that these are short-lived, few thousand years, maybe five to 10,000 years, when it was warm, and you add all of these up, and it doesn't come anywhere near 780,000 years because most of that time, the Earth was in a glaciated state and everything was cooler. The other thing about this diagram shows on this side the sea level in meters. And during this last 780,000 years, most of the time, sea level was much lower than it is today. And it was only 13,000 years ago when this melting of glaciers increased so fast that sea level rose to where it is today. It's still rising. Next. This chart is the same one. The blue is temperature from the Antarctic ice core. Uh, and it goes back 420,000 years. The red line is the one I want you to focus on because the blue lines just reinforce what I just showed you in the previous slide. The red line is CO2. Notice the CO2, it goes up and down. When it's warm, there's more CO2 for a variety of reasons. Notice it never gets much higher than about 280 parts per million. There's one here that just creeps over to 300 almost. Nowadays, what do you know about how much CO2 is in the atmosphere today? 400 parts per million plus. And we've never seen that for the last two million years, even longer. There's more CO2 in the atmosphere today, and that's what's driving uh, global climate change because it's the CO2 as a greenhouse gas and traps the heat and then re-radiates it down onto the earth. So CO2 is the villain here, if you will, although it's necessary for everything about life. When it's in the atmosphere in too much, for example, Venus is 96% CO2 in the atmosphere and the surface temperature of that planet is 700 degrees. 
Mars, which has the same percentage, is minus 61, but the atmosphere is much, much less dense, a hundredth that of Earth, and it's much farther from the Sun than the Earth or Venus. So we are a greenhouse planet by definition, and we always have been, and at times in the geologic past, we've seen evidence that it was 15 part, 1,500 parts per million, for example, during the time of the dinosaurs. Next. And I show you this slide as the last one. This is the Berkeley Earth summary of all of these different uh, data sets. And you'll, you can see that back before 1880 or so, there's a lot of air, that's the gray. But after that, it takes off and the trend is up like that with temperature. It tracks the CO2. But notice that there are times when it was a little bit cooler, a little bit cooler, and here a long period of more cooler temperatures, but the trend is still going up. So it's the trend, not the individual year data. Although the last, what is it? Last uh, 15 years has been a little bit cooler than others. And there's a reason for it. We understand that, we think, although the data needs to come in. It's a transfer of heat from the surface waters of the ocean to the deeper layers. And that may be one of the important things that we have yet to figure out. through a few topics here uh, about what I do and give you a perspective on how that relates to the study of modern climate change. So what, what do I study? How do we study past climate? And what do we know so far? All right, so what do I study? I study past climate. Go ahead, you might as well put them all up there because I don't have the control. Um, I study past climate. And this is a relatively young field called paleoclimatology. Paleo means past, climatology means the study of climate. The significance is that paleoclimatologists are like money market analysts for past climate. So when I talk to my father who owned a company for 40 years and is a staunch climate denier, even though he funded his son to go to college for many years to study climate, <laughs> ironically, uh, I put it in terms of money because that's what he understands. And what we do as paleoclimatologists is by studying the past, we provide a perspective. In the, in the same way that if I gave you all a million dollars to invest in the stocks, if you were smart, you would, in, you would actually investigate the stocks before you made that investment. If you weren't, you wouldn't, and you'd probably lose a lot of money, right? So having a paleo perspective on how things changed in the past is critical for future management, uh, and investments as related to climate. And so that's what I do. I don't actually study modern climate uh, with one paper, exception of a paper I wrote in 2004 about global warming and lake effect snow in Northeast United States that now every time it snows there, people says global warming is not happening when I wrote the exact same, op the opposite thing, but hey, that's life. <laughs> All right, so simply put, knowledge is required to make a sound decision. And that's what I do to the study of paleoclimatology. So how do I study past climate? What I use are proxies. And proxies are preserved in tree rings, lake sediments, ocean sediments, ice cores, heliothems, which come from caves, pack rat middens, you name them. Anything that has a time perspective can be used to extract past climate information more or less. So proxies are a substitute for climate-related phenomena, such as droughts, floods, fires, vegetation. For example, no one was standing around Southern California 5,000 years ago with a thermometer or a rain gauge. And if they were, they didn't tell us, because we don't have evidence of that. But I do have mud from lakes that go back thousands and thousands of years, such as this one section of mud here from Lake Elsinore that's dated at 24,000 years ago. In this mud, as I go from the bottom to the top, is like a history book. And in that history book, each layer tells me what was going on around the lake at that time. 
So I can literally take this history book and say, it was very rainy, it was less rainy, it was warmer, it was colder, there was a lot more pine trees, there were less pine trees. All of these things I can extract from these mud archives in much the same way that you can extract history information from a history book. But of course, the quality of the history book is only as good as the quality of the archive. So, to put it in perspective for you, uh, who may not be scientists, sometimes I find a history book that is like a history of the Civil War written in five pages. Eh, it's pretty good, but it's not telling you the details. What I'm looking for is a history book of the Civil War that's in five or 500 or 1,000 pages, where I can get in there and really pull out individual, meaningful climatological and meteorological phenomena. So what do we know so far? What have we learned? And I'm not going to put up any graphs. If you're interested at all in falling asleep real quick and reading my papers, uh, you can write me or whatever and, or download them yourself. But we've learned that over the past 10,000 years, there have been droughts longer than anything we've seen in the past 150 years. We've also learned that there have been larger floods than anything we've seen in the past 150 years. In fact, the arc storm uh, model used by the USGS to predict an extreme precipitation event followed by flooding of California is probably too small compared to what I see in my lake sediments. I've also learned that there are rapid changes in winter season atmospheric circulation. This is a big deal because here in Southern California there's only one thing that matters for precipitation and that's winter. Summer doesn't matter, no matter what you think. It doesn't matter. What matters is winter. How much we get in the winter. And we're working on a, a paper right now uh, that we can show using a really interesting proxy that atmospheric circulation changes extremely abruptly. In other words, where the storms come from. If they come from one place, Southern California is dry. If they come from another, Southern California is wet. And in this most recent research from north of Santa Barbara in a little lake called Zaca Lake, we see that there's been a period of nearly 600 years where Southern California was dry. Nearly 600 years in duration. Followed by a period of time of almost the same duration where it was wetter than average. And so that's pretty significant compared in length compared to things that we've extracted from just the past 150 years. We also see using pollen uh, with a colleague I have back east that there are abrupt changes in vegetation that follow these climatic changes. And this is a really big deal because whether or not you know it, that red area here is called the California Floristic Province. It's one of the world's 20 or 25 biodiversity hotspots. A hotspot is a place where biodiversity is being lost at a rate faster than some percentage that I don't have off the top of my head. What I can tell you is it's bad, <laughs> all right? What this means is that you live in an area that is rapidly degrading. And with climate change, my research can tell you that it will degrade even rap more rapidly. Because we can see in the past, I can tell you in the past that the vegetation changes very quickly in response to climate. There may be a time, I tell my students, when you're not going to snow or ski anymore in Southern California. You're going to have to go into Sierra Nevadas or maybe to Colorado. But skiing up in the mountains of Southern California may be a thing of the past sooner than later. Not to mention the change in vegetation. So why does all this matter? It matters because all of the things that I see in the paleo record in the past happened without a significant human factor. Humans were not impacting climate in the past like they are today. There are some hypotheses that suggest that our impact started a little earlier than we think, maybe, in the, maybe as early as 5,000 years ago. But it was still small by comparison to what's happening today. And so we are concerned about how anthropogenic global warming will impact future climatic variability and extreme events such as major floods and droughts, particularly for my research here in Southern California. Why? Because we have a very large population that continues to grow, 
and we have very few resources. We live arguably in one of the most hazardous places you can live in the world. <laughs> but the weather's great, so it's nice to say. <clears throat> so lastly, to try to bring this, as I mentioned before, to something tangible for you, uh, think about the California Floristic Province Biodiversity Hotspot. It's that red area there that makes up almost the entire state of California. That entire area is in a state of decay. And with future climate change, it will only decay more and more. So if you haven't seen Sequoia National Park like I just did this past weekend for the first time ever, go check it out. Because who knows how long we have before real significant change happens. Okay, well, I, I'd like to talk about what all this means to us. Obviously, hopefully most of you are convinced the climate is changing, uh, that we're responsible for what's going on. So what does that mean in the future? Um, generally speaking, I want to sort of make some general remarks and then talk about what's going to happen here in California. You know, some of this is just plain common sense. You know, the, the temperature gets hotter, you know, more moisture evaporates, you know, and then the hot air holds more moisture, so you have more rain. Hello. I mean, that one's pretty simple, so we'll see more floods. Temperature gets hotter, dries out areas. And what happens is that, that it's not so much that the climate changes, it's that the climate that we have becomes intensified and it becomes more erratic. So if you're in, living in a dry place, it becomes drier. And one of the things that I heard said you know, by scientists that really I found extremely worrisome is that you know, right now we talk about you know, places being in a drought. But at a certain point, we stopped talking about them being in a drought because the weather has changed. I mean, we wouldn't talk about the Sahara being in a drought because it becomes desert. And I think this is what we're looking at in the future here. Now here in Southern California and in California in general, the uh, four things about climate change that are gonna most impact us are sea level rise, drought, fires, and uh, the spread of diseases. Okay, you can see, you know, the, this is another one of those charts. Um, this is going back to 1870, you know, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. We start getting more and more uh, carbon parts per million. You know, the air gets hotter. You know, we get more glacier melt, empties into the sea. And so you have the sea level rise. You know, and here it's approximately a little bit more than maybe between 8 and 10 inches. Uh, tomorrow, uh, the intergovernmental uh, panel um, is issuing its report and one of the things that it'll talk about in its report is that between now and the end of the century, sea level will rise on average, on average, anywhere between uh, 21 inches and 3 feet. Now, that may not seem like a lot, but the t that kind of temperature, that kind of sea level rise means that uh, the entire panhandle of Florida will be underwater. Uh, most of Manhattan Island will be underwater. Uh, there's a lot of debate as to whether Superstorm Sandy itself was caused by climate change, and I don't want to bore you. I only have 10 minutes, so I don't want to get into all that scientific debate. But what's not in debate is that the storm surge that washed over lower Manhattan and left uh, people without power, the bottom half of Manhattan, I think somewhere you know south of Central Park, for over a week, was caused by the rising uh, seas. So that was definitely climate change related. Okay, this is what's relevant to Californians. Uh, all 58 counties of California have been declared a flood disaster in the past 20 years. One in five Californians live in a floodplain. Millions of people, $580 billion asset, exposed to flood risks. California faces an acceptable threat to public safety. And this is uh, not some wild-eyed radical, this is the California Department of Water Resources. Um, Sacramento, go ahead. Sacramento is one of the most flood-prone cities in the world. Um, there's a wonderful, not wonderful, but there's a story when uh, Leland Stanford, who was one of the early governors, 
of uh, California uh, was inaugurated, the the flood, the waters flow, uh, rained so hard that Sacramento was um, flooded out, and he had to uh, attend his inauguration by rowing to San Francisco. So we may see this kinds of thing again. Um, Sacramento, San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, these are our major cities. They're all vulnerable to sea level rise. Go ahead. Okay, this is a study by the National Resources Defense Council. And what this means in English <laughs> is that in other parts of the country, you know, they're withdrawing water, but then it rains and it sort of replenishes it. We're overdrawing. In other words, we're maxing out our credit cards here and we're not putting it back. And it's only going to get worse. All right, you can see this is a little graph. This is from um, the National Oceanic uh, Association. And you can see uh, deep red, Southern California. Um, and this is a, a progressing to 2050, so we're looking at severe drought here. Go ahead. This is uh, one of the reservoirs that supplies um, this area with water. You can see it's drying up. This is 2005 after several years of drought. Lake Mead, another reservoir. Again, <laughs> the reason why this is so important is that, you know, you build a reservoir and you build what's called intake valves to sort of suck the water out. And once the water drops below the level of the intake valves, you can't get any more water out of there. So this is very worrisome that the water level is uh, dipping so precipitously on the reservoirs. Go ahead. Colorado River. Um, Colorado supplies uh, water to uh, most of the western states. This is drying up. Another thing about the Colorado River, and this is just like one of those little, you know, factoids that, you know, people like us are interested in. Um, the Colorado River in 1922, it sort of divided up, you know, between, you know, the western states. You'll get this much, you'll get that much. And it, it was sort of allocated, um, you know, everybody got a certain share of the river, you know, California, Arizona, places like that. But what they found out is that they based the water allocations on the 1922 and preceding years precipitation, and those were wet years. And recent studies have said that the California, uh, Colorado River is completely overdrawn. So what we're looking at is a much drier future. Okay, Yosemite Rim Fires. You know, they can't say each particular fire that happens is caused by climate change. But generally speaking, you were going to have more wildfires for a couple reasons. Number one, you know, again, this is just all common sense. It's drier, it dries out the, you know, the vegetation, you know, you have more kindling. The other thing that's happening, and this is definitely a climate change related issue, and this again has to do with how the ecosystems change in very subtle ways when the temperature gets higher. There's a thing called a bark beetle infestation. Some of you may have heard about this. But what happens is that the bark beetles carry these funguses and they, you know, burrow into the bark of the trees and they leave the funguses behind. And then the funguses sort of eat away at the trees and the trees rot and then they die, which provides more kindling for the fires. Now, how this is climate change related is that the bark beetles now are reproducing twice in a season instead of once. So do the math, there's more bark beetles. Uh, the second piece is that they can fly further. So that means that they can infect more places. And as a result, we have millions of acres of forests that are being decimated by the bark beetle. And they're very worried about the boreal forests in Canada. And these are huge carbon sinks, so you get these feedback loops too, which is really very worrisome. Go ahead. Yeah, Yosemite Fire now the third largest in California history. And, you know, obviously climate change is not the only reason this happened. You know, there are other reasons, fire management techniques, but climate change is a key driver. Go ahead, and see, this is the other thing too, is that climate change doesn't always, doesn't just cause fires, but there's sort of a cascade effect. So when we had the, you'd say the Yosemite Rim Fire, for example, it threatened San Francisco reservoirs. We were very lucky, nothing happened, but it could have. 
All right, another aspect is uh, the spread of what's called vector-borne diseases. Now, vector is the Greek word to carry. And, you know, when you talk about vector-borne diseases, those are the kinds of diseases that are spread by what are called vectors. Insects, mosquitoes, you know, Lyme disease, which is spread by a tick. We have Lyme disease, which started in Lyme, Connecticut. It's now in Canada. Uh, we have, uh, we're starting to have seeing uh, dengue fever, which is, uh, was, largely confined to Central and South America. It's now endemic in Florida and the Florida Keys. We had outbreaks in uh, Texas. And the reason why is that the mosquito that carries dengue fever now is able to live in the United States. Uh, here in California, uh, we have, we're gonna start seeing spreading outbreaks of uh, valley fever. Valley fever is a fungal disease that's carried by fungal spores. Uh, the climate change link with this is that, um, you know, when it's hot and dry, it uh, cuts off all the surface vegetation. So that what happens is that when you do get windstorms, it carries the spores further. Uh, the other piece is that you get the, again, you lose the surface vegetation so that it, when it does rain, it goes deep into the soil and it's the fungal spores that are, you know, uh, that are, get the water so that they reproduce themselves too. So we're starting to see a uh, great spread of valley fever and, you know, the CDC calls this a silent epidemic. Sickens as many as 200,000 people annually, claims at least 200 lives a year, and it's spreading. It's increased by something like 850% in the past 10 years in the Central Valley. Okay, anyway, go ahead. All right, and another piece of this is bad air. You know, we dump 31.5 gigatons of CO2 into the air every single year. I mean, it's just hard to wrap your brain around what that actually means. But one gigaton is 100 billion tons, which is equivalent to about twice, twice the rate of every person on this planet. So 31.6 gigatons is about 60 times the weight of every person on this planet, and we're dumping that into the atmosphere every single year. And as my husband says, what could go wrong? You know, <laughs> we're doing all this to the climate system. So what happens is that we're dumping all this uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The other piece of it is that sunlight cooks particulates in the atmosphere and it creates smog, which causes all kinds of respiratory difficulties. So again, this is just common sense. As the temperature goes up, you're gonna get more smog and we keep dumping more of this stuff into the atmosphere, so it's gonna be worse and worse. Uh, bad air's harmful effects kill at least 24,000 Californians every year. This is the California Air Resources Board information. In Los Angeles, Riverside, and the Central Valley, residents have a 25% higher risk of dying from respiratory diseases, and that's only going to get worse, because we're gonna start seeing carbon domes form over cities, and there are places already in California, such as the Central Valley, uh, and places like Long Beach, Riverside, where you start getting these inversion layers and carbon domes, and you have these high incidents of asthma, allergies, and other respiratory diseases. I've even seen studies that link pollution to dementia and heart disease, so this is just all stuff to think about. Is again bad air. I, you know, I was tra I drove through the Central Valley yesterday. It's unbelievable. You know, you come over the hill and it's like you know driving into this blanket of smog, and it's only going to get worse. And you know, again, there are collateral effects from this bad air. Um, California. The average in California is that 23 percent of Californians are college graduates. In the Central Valley, that figure is 12 percent. So you understand the people that can leave. So this is another collateral damage from all of this. Okay, but <laughs> there is some good news. 
Um, I have to say, I, when I was writing my book, uh, I started writing my book in 2009, and at that time, very few people were talking about climate change, and, you know, especially in Washington, they were debating whether it was happening, you know, and I really sort of felt like I was in this alternative universe, because I talked to scientists, their hair is on fire, they're terrified, and, you know, and then I, you know, come up for air, and, you know, everybody was mowing their lawns and not paying any attention. So I thought, oh my God, you know, we're sort of careening over to the abyss and we're really done for. But then I started really sort of digging in and talking to people and I found that on a local level, people take climate change very seriously. Civic leaders across the country really take climate change very seriously. They're planning for it. They're trying to create mitigation strategies so their cities can um, survive and adapt. And here in Orange County, California, I, I tell people this and they laugh, but I'm very serious. Orange County, California is one of the world leaders in water management. I don't know if you guys know this, but they have won every single prize in the water management world, including the Stockholm Prize, which is sort of like the Nobel Prize of water management. And as you can see, I'm, I'm extremely happily drinking sewage. And I know many of you drink sewage, about 20% of the population here in uh, Orange County drinks sewage. And what they did here in Orange County, and I went to a water summit a couple months ago, and you know, I, I mean, these are all water managers, they're scientists, and they talk about climate change. It's not a debate, it's what we're gonna do. And the water managers that I talked to down here about 10 years ago said we looked at the future and it looked really dry. And we couldn't really depend on the allocations from the Colorado River or from the Sierra snowpack. So they talked about building, you know, this um, toilet to tap program where they purify sewage water. And right now, 20% of your water comes from this type of purification process, and they have uh, plans to build more, and hopefully it'll get up to 40%. And this is where we must go with water management. Okay, this is Pat Mulroy. She's another leader in the water management world. Pat Mulroy has what they say is the toughest job in water management. She's the general water manager for Las Vegas. And Las Vegas is probably the driest city in the driest state in the Union. And going back to that 1922 water compact, that was sort of based on, you know, farming and, um, you know, sort of your needs for agrarian um, communities. And obviously there wasn't much farming going on in Nevada, so they didn't get much from the Colorado River. They got sort of a minuscule amount. So she's faced with keeping water for two million residents plus 40 million visitors every year. And what Pat Mulroy has done in Las Vegas, we all must do. I mean, the first thing she did was she went to all the owners of all the resorts, she got them to pay to recycle all the water and all their water features. The second thing she did is she paid for a cash for grass program. And a friend of mine said it was up to Pat Mulroy, she'd rip out every blade of grass in Las Vegas County. Uh, the third thing she did was uh, institute stringent water measures so that, you know, the people in Las Vegas are really very conservation conscious. The upshot is the average water usage for most people is anywhere between 125 and 135 gallons a day. Las Vegas, it's 75 gallons, and she's aiming for 50. So there's a lot of good things going on. So the point is that we can fix this but we have to start now. Anyway, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. So we've come to our question and answer portion of the program. Does anybody have a card they want to start out with? Well, I'll see, oh, we do, okay, great. So then, um, if you have cards with questions, if you pass them to the center aisle, and um, uh, Janine will, will collect them uh, as the panel answers this one. Um, so this question says, uh, Mark Jacobson and his team at Stanford have been doing analysis on 100% renewable energy sources, i.e. wind and offshore solar hydro. Please come on to comment on this approach. Of energy. 
Well, I, I think that um, the thing that I think about renewable sources of energy is that tremendous advances have been made, and I don't think people realize how close we are. The big stumbling block for renewable energy is that, you know, the sun doesn't shine all the time, hello, and the wind doesn't blow all the time. So um, how do we store all this? And interestingly enough, in Colorado, and I'm going there next week to visit this new facility that just broke open to the stores in the past week, that is going to be testing new devices that are going to create storage for renewable energy. And I really think that we are within 10 years of being able to shift to renewable energy. And while I'm on this, you know, I know that there's been sort of this big push to natural gas. And I think this is just based on, you know, talking to a lot of different scientists. I, I really truly believe that, you know, even though natural gas is cleaner than coal, it's a very costly detour, and we really need to move straight to renewables. Great, thank you, Linda. So uh, we'll leave this one to uh, the panel to decide who wants to take it. Is uh, climate change that we are currently experiencing natural or man-made, and how do you know this? It's man-made. The natural rate was 280 parts per million CO2. We're now at 400 parts per million. That causes the increase in temperature. That's just a matter of thermodynamics. It's straightforward physics. <clears throat> I think one, uh, I teach a uh, course on Earth's environmental crises. I know that sounds very depressing. <laughs> but uh, I spend the first five weeks talking about global warming. And the kicker that really gets my students thinking about this is when we look at models, and models are not evidence, but one of the most compelling, um, I guess, pieces of evidence for global warming is when uh, global climate models take uh, known measured temperature, and then they take a computer model, and they inject that computer model with only natural forcings, meaning volcanism, solar forcing, normal CO2 levels. And when they do that, the computers cannot mimic the temperature change that we have seen. But as soon as these computer models take and use these same forcings plus add human forcings, the match is unbelievably similar. And to me, that's one of the most compelling things right there, that you, just, you simply can't reconstruct, observe temperature on our planet unless you take into account the radiative forcing of greenhouse gases that have been put there specifically by human activity. Okay. So this is a, in a, a, a very good question. Um, NASA's Climate Change Division reported on September 23rd of this year that their analysis of satellite data by NSIDC and NASA found that the Arctic sea ice reached its smallest extent recorded by satellites at 1.32 million square miles just for this year, which is half the size of the average minimum extent for the last 20 year, 30 years. Um, on the other hand, reports state that over the last 15 years, there's been a slowdown in temperature rec rise recorded in the atmosphere. And I think that uh, Dr. Lips alluded to this in his talk. And the question is, so therefore, we have contradictory evidence, slower, smaller sea ice, but observed cooling over the last few years. So what's your take on the contrary climate results? And I, I know that Dr. Lips commented on this, so I'll, I'll let him start. Climate change is a funny thing because there's so many elements involved. And in a certain sense, I like to think about a pot of boiling water on a stove set at a low temperature. The burner is the climate and the weather and all the other stuff are the perturbations that are going on by, by the boiling water. It's changing all the time, sometimes in one direction, sometimes in another. And when you have a system like the Earth working with the surface, the atmosphere, and several layers in the ocean. There's all kinds of things going on. 
interacting with one another. And that curve that I showed you in the very last slide, the Berkeley Earth Curve and the other ones, uh, shows that there were periods of, uh, of times when the average temperature of the Earth did not increase, but the overall trend continued. And there is an explanation for that. Uh, and it may have to do with the transfer of heat from surface waters to deeper water. We know deep water, indeed, the water all the way to the bottom of the ocean, has warmed considerably, and it's a big pool or uh, reservoir of heat. So it's a complicated system, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to continue to grow along that projection of increasing temperature. From a paleoclimate perspective, uh, my world is filled with constant contradictions. I have one proxy that says it's wet and another that says it was less wet and one that says it was, you know, maybe even moderately dry. And so you have to look at the preponderance of evidence and you particularly have to look at trends as well. And that's what we have to focus on is not these short-term fluctuations in the natural behavior of the system, which we're seeing right now with this 15-year uh, slow down and with you know what appear to be contradictory evidence. Scientists who study this see past that. They want to explain it because it's interesting, but no scientist will say, ah, I guess based on that 15 years, it's all good, right? It's not. They see the long-term perspective, and that's why geologists are trained to do this. And one of the analogies I use, again, I use my poor father as an example, is that <clears throat> and I find this very strange about how our society deals with scientists over this issue, is that when there are problems, you go to the experts to solve those problems. Let me give you an example. If you have a broken leg, you go to the hospital and you have a doctor fix it, and you don't argue with that doctor about whether your leg is broken. But the earth is presently broken, we can think of it that way, it's injured. We know why is, it, why is it injured, but we're going to politicians. Would you have a broken leg and go to your mayor or your congressman or woman and say, hey, my leg's broken, can you help me out, right? No, that's ludicrous. But for some reason, and my friends who teach philosophy would be able to explain this better because they understand the dynamic of the human mind, uh, people are afraid of climate change because of how it possibly infringes on, on their really their fundamental belief system. And so they're shunning science when in fact they should be embracing it. And until we learn to embrace science, scientists and accept them as the experts in this, we're going to continue to have these arguments. I think in 50 years we're all going to look back and have a good laugh about this because we'll be like, wow, I can't believe it was ever even a discussion. Yeah. Well, we're not going to go extinct. We are the first organism, as far as we know, that could consciously drive ourselves to extinction. And that's perhaps the most strange thing about humans. And that's why people say we're like a virus. <laughs> Okay, so here's a, a great follow-on question to the discussion of what's going on in the oceans. Um, the question is, what has been found about ocean acidification related to increased carbon in the atmosphere? And as a related question, does this relate to the acid rain crises in the 80s and ozone depletion in the 70s? So, um, ocean acidification. The, o the oceans are becoming more acidic, we know that. Um, and as a result, coral reefs are in, are in danger. Is it related to acid rain? Only in the, in the way that what caused acid rain was anthropogenic. And so all of that, I mean, you know, you go, students here when I teach environmental crises, we talk about acid rain briefly because you live in Southern California and you don't have acid rain, because why? You live downwind from an ocean. All right, but if you're from where I am, upstate New York in the Adirondacks, your lakes are dead because you live downstream from Chicago and Milwaukee and Buffalo and Toronto. All right, major rust belt cities that are spewing a tremendous amount of pollution in the atmosphere that are causing acid rain. Uh, so you're, the oceans are not more acidic because of acid rain, they're more acidic because of human pollution, gases that are going into the atmosphere. 
uh, as well as other things that maybe Jerry as a geochemist can talk about or, or yourself. <clears throat> Well, the thing about the oceans is that the oceans are a carbon sink, and what that means is that they absorb carbon dioxide. And the oceans absorb 50 times more carbon dioxide than the atmosphere does. So, you know, this is sort of like, you know, your Aunt Tilly who does all the work in the house, right? You know, I mean, the, the oceans are the ones that really are doing all the work. and. The oceans are um, acidifying uh, and have less alkalinity in them and are acidifying 100 times faster than they have in the past 20 million years. I mean, that is really scary to me. I mean, if you look at the Earth, it's mostly covered with ocean. And our climate, the weather that we have, the weather patterns that we have are really governed very deeply by ocean currents. And we're, we're fooling around with a system that could have extremely scary consequences. So that's the other piece about the uh, acidification of the ocean. It's very, very scary. And, you know, the other piece of this is, that, you know, we're killing off all the plant life. You know, Matt talked about that. You know, we're killing off the coral reefs. We're killing off the uh, ocean food chain. You know, at some point, you know, some scientists are predicting that the only thing that we're going to see left in the oceans is jellyfish they won't be able to support life. So I find all this very, very scary. Jellyfish, huh? I've been uh, looking at uh, ocean acidification for a long time because the fossil organisms and the living ones that I study are made of calcium carbonate, which dissolves in these weak um, carbonic acid situations that we find the oceans developing today. As CO2 goes into this 70% of the Earth's surface reservoir called the oceans, it is converted in part to carbonic acid, and that's what's causing the uh, acidification problem. It's not acid yet, but it's trending in that direction. The way organisms react to that is, seems to be organism-specific. For example, uh, commercial oysters fail in acidification because the, their larvae uh, can't develop shells, so they don't grow. Uh, other things don't secrete li uh, little algae that have calcium carbonate shells. They can't secrete those shells, and these are phytoplankton, so they can't live. And they are the basis of the food chain. And it turns out that when I look at the big extinctions in Earth history, they're almost always correspond to massive volcanic eruptions that loaded the atmosphere with CO2, increased ocean acidification, and caused massive extinction across the world in all ecosystems. So global warming has the possibility of causing extinction in all ecosystems from the deep sea to the highest mountains. It's a very serious problem when it's really intense. I don't think we're gonna get there. Certainly not in my lifetime. So um, the next question is, I've read that the climate has not changed in the last 17 years in many, ed many editorials. Are you aware of what this is based on and if it's true? Who would like to take this? I, I don't know about you, but I, I read the paper. Has anybody read the paper lately? I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'm, I know I'm not speaking scientifically, but um, just a little story. Um, when I wrote my book, one of the people that I wrote about was a fellow by the name of Billy Shanks, and he's a, a fire department captain in uh, New Orleans. And Billy is extremely conservative. I always say his politics are to the right of its whole hunt. Very nice guy. And when I was doing the book, I told him, I said, Billy, look, I, I really, I don't want you to feel exploited when the book comes out. It's about climate change. And he said, I'm a firefighter. You don't have to tell me about climate change. All I have to do is look out the window. So that's kind of my answer. You know, I realize that's not a scientific answer, but we can see. I mean, look at the floods that just happened in Colorado. Look at Superstorm Sandy. I mean, it's very obvious that, you know, we're really starting to have much more extreme weather. Look at the heat waves that we had this summer and last summer. You know, I think of last summer, 2012, as sort of the tipping point, you know, in our awareness of climate change. 
There was a cover story in Business Week that said, it's global warming, stupid. You know, that was sort of the cover story, you know, and I, to me, this really sort of points up what's going on. You know, again, as I mentioned, when I first started writing the book in 2009, no one was talking about this. But I think in 2012, we really had a tipping point. You know, we've got drought that covers most of the country. We're having all kinds of extreme weather events. We just had this fire in Yosemite that incinerated a 60-mile zone, you know, and on and on and on and on. So, yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, as, you know, Jerry pointed out, you know, there is, you know, certain fluctuations and variations in the climate system. But I think most of us can look out the window and see what's going on. The other piece of this is that, you know, when I was writing the book, I was sort of really despairing and I was thinking, God, you know, no one's paying attention to this issue. The oil and gas industry sort of has a stranglehold on the dialogue. What's going to happen? And scientists pointed out to me that there's a lot of people that you wouldn't expect who are also stakeholders in this debate. I talked to ranchers. I talked to farmers. They know climate change is happening. All they have to do again is just look out the window. One of the things that scientists are facing right now is a very strong campaign of misinformation. Uh, in, in the same way that you know cigarettes were shown to be okay for a long time, right? And only recently have we all accepted. In fact, they are pretty bad for you. Okay. So this uh, campaign of mis misinformation is really from a silent majority. Uh, and what happens is that to the non-scientist, uh, you are constantly bombarded with a 50-50 viewpoint. Uh, the Daily Titan, Cal State Fullerton's newspaper, asked me to provide them with some quote about someone who was coming to campus to talk about global warming. I provided a quote. They found the one person on campus who was a business professor, not a scientist, who said that global warming is a conspiracy. So now a student who's uneducated in science reads that article and says, well, a scientist says it's real, and this dude says it's not. That's a 50-50 split. That, means, that must mean that we don't know if global warming's real. And that's exactly what's happening. It's a com campaign of misinformation. And as non-scientists, it's very difficult to know what's pseudoscience and what's good science. So it's no fault of yours because it's difficult. It's just the problem is that people are feeding you wrong information. And so you've got to figure out where that good information is. And that can be very challenging. Yeah, I, I, one thing that you said, I, I, I don't think is actually true. It, it's not a silent majority. I mean, studies have been done and only 8% of the population thinks global warming is a hoax. The rest of the population, um, you know, is sort of a range, you know, people well, recognize. It's not a hoax. I mean, I mean, the recent report suggests that it's as high as 40%. Okay, well. In the Yale study, the Pew report. Okay, well, I'll, okay, well, I'll send you the study that I've seen. I'll send you my study. Okay. It's All right. good for the panel to disagree about what yeah. we All right, but, but the other piece of this is that I think the other problem lies with people like me, and not people necessarily like me, but in the media. There's a thing called what we call false equivalency, which drives us science writers nuts. Because every time you have one opinion, you have to, you know, find the one idiot, you know, at some, you know, industry-sponsored think tank will give you, you know, the opposite view. And so what happens is you think, well, there's one for and one against, and that's really not the case. 97% of all, you know, scientists who are working on this issue think this is really happening. 3% don't. And, you know, the old question is that if, if, if you had cancer or you wanted to drive over a bridge and 97% of engineers told you not to drive over the bridge. What would you do? Would you drive? I personally would not drive over the bridge. But I will send you that study. <laughs> I'd like to focus on the 65. I heard it was 35%. <laughs> Don't like climate change. But 65% of the people are convinced. In fact, I didn't put it on my chart of people who um, disagree with the anti-climate change people, but there's a group of young Republicans who do not accept the anti-climate change rhetoric of their own party because they, they can reason through all of this stuff that we've been telling you and they understand that it is changing. 
So there's a lot of hope out there. And this is, uh, Lyndon was talking about how people seem to have uh, just gotten onto this since 2009. And I think that's probably true for the general public, but scientists have known about this since 1896, even well before that. And it became particularly important when um, scientists in the 50s started talking about it. I have slides that I used in my Geology 1 class in 1970 that I could show you that look, in fact, I didn't put one in, I wish I had now, that look exactly like those curves that I showed in my presentation. And the big joke was looking at the sidebar where it showed how sea level was rising and how it would continue to rise, is that which campus of the UC system was going to go first? Well, it would be San Diego, or San Diego, San Diego, <laughs> Irvine, which is pretty close to sea level. It would be uh, Davis, which is only 49 feet above sea level if all the ice melted. And standing above them all would be Berkeley. <laughs> okay, so it's getting a little bit late, so I'm gonna, um, uh, I'm not gonna be able to get through all of the questions, but I thought this was an interesting one um, that if we have a brief answer to. Um, I thought smog has decreased a lot in Southern California since the 60s. Can you put your comments in the perspective of the decrease and the, the improvement of air quality with the decrease of smog? That's true. I mean, it definitely has. You know, we had catalytic converters put on the cars. The air is much cleaner here. But how long can we sustain that? I mean, we're putting all this uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, plus the temperature is going up. But that's absolutely true. But we're starting to see uh, carbon domes. Uh, somebody mentioned Mark Jacobson uh, at Stanford. He's also done research on carbon domes. And what he talks about is that this, this terrible air, this smoggy air forms over cities. And, you know, it starts, you know, impacting and people start getting respiratory diseases. You know, look at what's happening in Beijing. Look at what's happening in Salt Lake City. Look at what's happening in the Central Valley, and look at what's happening in the industrialized zones in Los Angeles, you know, down at the harbor and places like that. So yeah, of course, absolutely. You know, we really have cleaned up the air, and that's a really positive thing, and that also indicates what we need to do because the politicians were pushed into doing this and creating much more stringent controls. But we live in a global ecosystem. You know, and it would be very nice to live on the little nice, you know, California island where, you know, we're building seawalls and we're really trying to prepare for climate change and other people are ignoring it. But there's no way that we can avoid having the kind of bad air that's going to be existing over much of the globe in the next 50 years. Okay, so um, I'm going to leave us with a, a, a thought. Uh, We've heard about some of the questions about whether superstorms stand sandy or individual droughts. There's always a question of whether or not this is climate change. This is finally a, a storm or an event created by climate change. And I, I heard a wonderful uh, discussion of this recently uh, that was said that, think of a baseball player on steroids. If a baseball player is on steroids, you don't look at that one home run and say, that home run was because of steroids or that one wasn't. You can't say that. All you know is that he's getting a lot more home runs than he used to. And that's the same situation that we see with our climate due to the increase in carbon dioxide. And so I'm gonna leave you with the thought that we need to do whatever we can to stop our baseball players taking steroids. And we need to do whatever we can to take our climate off of steroids as well. Thank you and have a good night.